Good morning, everybody, and can I welcome members to the 22nd meeting in 2017 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Agenda item one is decision on taking business in private, and it's proposed that the committee take items five, six, and seven in private. Item five is the consideration of the committee's draft stage one report on the Forestry and Land Management Scotland Bill. Item six is the committee's consideration of the report on instruments considered by the committee during the fourth quarter of the parliamentary year 2016-17. And item seven is the consideration of the committee's work programme. So does the committee agree to take items five, six and seven in private? Thank you. Now move to agenda item two, which is the contract third party rights Scotland Bill. And we now turn to the formal stage two proceedings on the bill. And I welcome Annabel Ewing, the Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs. Good morning, Minister. Uh, I welcome Katrina Marshall, Solicitor uh, for the Scottish Government Legal Directorate, and uh, Jill Clark, uh, our Bill Team Leader, uh, Civil Law Reform Unit at the Scottish Government. So I welcome to Katrina and Jill as well. Thank you. So, for the purposes of Stage 2, members should have copies of the Bill as well as the marshalled list and the groupings. And so, um, we now move to that stage. So the question is, as there have been no amendments in sections one to eight, the question is that amend, the question is that sections one to eight be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Now move to section 9 on arbitration. I call amendment 1 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendment 2. Uh, Minister, to move amendment 1 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Thank you, uh, uh, Convener. Um, I have set out previously that it would be a matter of concern the provisions in the Bill uh, are not readily understood. The Committee are aware of the concerns raised by the Faculty of Advocates in respect of section 9. My officials therefore met with the representative from the faculty to discuss those concerns and Section 9 in general. A number of the points raised uh, in those discussions uh, go, in fact, beyond third-party rights uh, into uh, uh, rather possible wider changes to the law of arbitration. Such changes were not part of the recommendations of the Scottish Law Commission that underpin the bill and, unlike the Law Commission's recommendations, have not been consulted on. I therefore do not consider the Bill to be the right vehicle for addressing all of the points raised by the Faculty. However, to the extent that the points raised by the Faculty expose a certain amount of confusion about what Section 9, Subsection 3 is intended to, to achieve, I think there is merit in amending it to clarify the intended relationship between Section 1 and Section 9. The bill is intended to allow contracting parties to give third parties uh, a right to resolve disputes by arbitration, even if the dispute arises from outside the contract, for example, personal injury claims which arise under the law of delict. The essentials necessary for the creation of this type of procedural third party right to arbitrate are the same as for any third party right and are set out in section 1. Section 1 is therefore the legal basis for a third party right to arbitrate as it is for any other kind of third party right. However, without further provision, a third party would be unable to enforce that right because under the Arbitration Scotland Act 2010, only a person who is a party to an arbitration agreement can go to arbitration. Section 9 of the bill is therefore a technical fix to overcome that obstacle. It allows someone with a third party right to arbitrate to be treated as a party to the relevant arbitration agreement. Section 9 is what we often call a deeming provision. It provides for someone who is not a party to an arbitration agreement to be deemed to be a party. This is a very common drafting uh, device. Exactly the same approach to uh, the issue of allowing third parties to arbitrate is taken by Section 8 of the Contracts Rights of Third Parties Act 1999, which applies in England and Wales. Amendment 1 is intended to make it absolutely explicit in Section 9, Subsection 3, Subsection C that the third party right is to enforce the undertaking to arbitrate. This should remove any doubt that the third party right referred to in that subsection must be a third party right arising 
uh, under Section 1. Amendment 2, uh, convener, is consequential on Amendment 1. I move uh, Amendment 1 uh, in my name. Thank you very much. Any comments from colleagues? And there being none, as far as I can see. Um, Minister, have you anything you wish to say in winding up or not? Uh, no, I think I've explained our position. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. And so the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Call Amendment 2 in the name of the Minister already debated with Amendment 1. Uh, Minister, to move formally, please. Formally moved. Thank you very much. And so the question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Uh, we now move to the renunciation of third party right. And I call Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister, a uh, group with Amendments 4, 5 and 7. Uh, Minister, to move Amendment 3 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, we have had an opportunity to reflect on the view offered by Professor Rosener on this section and also the Law Society's evidence to the Scottish Government that this provision is superfluous. And we have uh, in concluded that Section 10, Subsection 1 is not needed. Section 10, Subsection 1 provides for the third party to renounce their right and confirms that the effect of such renunciation is extinction of the right. It is simply a statement of what is already a matter of general principle. However, Section 10, Subsection 2 does remain in point as it provides that where a third party raises a court action, it is not to be taken as a renunciation of the right to submit the same dispute to arbitration. Amendment 5 will leave out Section 10, while Amendment 3 will move what is presently Subsection 2 of Section 10 to sit within the wider arbitration provisions of Section 9. Amendments 4 and 7 simply remove cross-references to Section 10. Uh, I move Amendment 3 in my name. Thank you very much, and we welcome that. Um, other members, anything to say or not? No. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Minister, anything further to add in winding up? Uh, no, thank you. Right, thank you. So the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 3. Minister, to move formally, please. Formally moved. Thank you. So the question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that Section 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Now move to uh, Section 10. And I call Amendment 5 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 3. Minister, to move formally, please. Formally moved. And so the question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. And so the question is that Section 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. Now move to Section 12 and the, the abolition of common law rule. Jusca Istim Tertio. And call Amendment 6 in the name of the Minister and the group on its own. Uh, Minister to move and speak to Amendment 6, please. In written evidence to the committee, Shepherd and Wedderburn raised the very valid issue of how the bill impacted on contingent or conditional third party rights which have not yet crystallised at the time the provisions of legislation are commenced. It was not uh, the intention that the bill should impact adversely on these rights. The amendment to section 12 subsection 1 addresses uh, the point raised. Uh, in that regard, uh, I think it would be important to put this in the context that because section 13 uh, allows um, contracting parties to choose to apply the bill's third-party rights uh, rules to pre-commencement undertakings. A single undertaking could therefore potentially give rise to both a common law and a statutory third-party right. Amendment 6 therefore uh, goes on to add new subsections 1a and 1b to section 12. The new subsection 1a is to ensure that if a pre-commencement contract gives rise to a statutory third-party right, any parallel common law right becomes unenforceable. This is to avoid uh, the confusion that could result from a third party simultaneously having a common law and a statutory third party right. Linked to uh, the new subsection, uh, this, uh, the new subsection 1b prevents a third party from being able to assign a statutory third party right to enforce an undertaking, uh, meaning someone else can enforce it, and then be able to enforce it themselves through a revived uh, common law right. Uh, I move Amendment 6 in my name. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Other members? Um, okay, Minister, nothing further to add, I presume? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so the question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. 
And so the question is that section 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. And I move to section 13 and call amendment 7 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with amendment 3. Minister, to move formally, please. Formally moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. So the question now is that section 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is that sections 14 and 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. And the question finally is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. So that ends the stage two consideration of the bill. And I would like to thank the Minister and our thank colleagues you. for coming um, to make your remarks to us this morning and delivering the stage two process. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Now suspend this um, meeting just for a second to allow the Minister to leave. Um, so, we now move to agenda item three then, if everyone's um, sitting comfortably. And, and that's instruments subject to the negative procedure. <coughs> the first item, the first instrument for consideration is the Loch Caron Urgent Marine Conservation No. 2, Order 2017, SSI 2017 No. 205. And this order urgently revokes and replaces the Loch Caron Urgent Marine Conservation Order 2017, SSI 2017, number 158. This is due to the Loch Caron Marine Protected Area being redesignated as a Nature Conservation Marine Protected Area by the Loch Caron Nature Conservation Marine Protected Area number 2, Order 2017. The order was made and laid before Parliament on the 14th of June 2017 and came into force on the 15th of June. It does not respect the requirement that at least 28 days should elapse between the laying of an instrument which is subject to the negative procedure and the coming into force of that instrument. Accordingly, does the committee agree to draw the order to the attention of Parliament under reporting ground J as there has been a failure to lay it in accordance with section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010. We agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Does the committee also agree to find the failure to comply with Section 28.2 to be acceptable in the circumstances as outlined in correspondence from the Scottish Government contained within our papers? Thank you. Next item for consideration is the Building Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 <laughs> SSI 2017 number 214. These regulations amend the Building Miscellaneous Amendments Scotland Regulations 2017 SSI 2017 number 188, which the committee considered at its meeting last week. The regulations were made and laid before the Parliament on the 20th of June 2017 and come into force on the 30th of June. They do not respect the requirement that at least 28 days should elapse between the laying of an instrument which is subject to the negative procedure and the coming into force of that instrument. Accordingly, does the committee also agree to draw these regulations to the attention of the Parliament under reporting ground J as there has been a failure to lay them in accordance with section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010? Thank you. Does the committee also agree to find the failure to comply with section 28.2 to be acceptable in the circumstances as outlined in correspondence from the Scottish Government contained within our papers? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so no points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Carers Scotland Act 2016, Prescribed Days Regulations 2017, SSI 2017 number 207. So, is the committee content with this instrument? Thank you. We move now to agenda item four, which is instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. And the next instrument for consideration is the Act of Sederant Summary Application Rules 1999 Amendment 
Trafficking and Exploitation Orders 2017, SSI 2017, number 211. This Act of Sedarent amends the Act of Sedarent Summary Applications, Statutory Applications and Appeals, etc. Rules, 1999, in consequence of the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act 2015. Paragraph 2.2b.1 and 2 insert references to a trafficking and exploitation prevention order and a trafficking and exploitation risk order, respectively, into Rule 3.45.2 of the Summary Applications, Statutory Applications and Appeals, etc. Rules 1999. However, our legal advisers have identified that references to the equivalent interim orders being an interim trafficking and exploitation prevention order and an interim trafficking and exploitation risk order have not been inserted. The instrument was laid on the 20th of June 2017 and there was therefore no time available for formal questions and a response to be issued and received in time for the committee's final meeting before the summer recess. It is appropriate for the committee to consider this instrument before the recess because the error that has been identified relates in part to a provision which commences on the 30th of June 2017. Expediting the committee's consideration of this instrument affords the committee an opportunity to comment on the drafting error before it comes into force rather than waiting until its first meeting following the recess on the 5th of September. So as a result of the lack of time available, the committee liaised informally with the Lord President's private office on the drafting error and the Lord President's private office has agreed informally to correct these omissions. Accordingly, does the committee agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament under the general reporting grounds as a result of the error identified at paragraph 22b1 and 2? Thank you. Does the committee also agree to welcome that the Lord President's private office has agreed informally to correct the omission in relation to interim trafficking and exploitation prevention orders at the next available opportunity, which it is, is anticipated will be within the next few weeks in light of such orders coming into force on the 30th of June 2017? Thank you. Finally, does the committee also agree to welcome that the Lord President's private office has agreed informally to correct their mission in relation to interim trafficking and exploitation risk orders prior to such orders coming into force on the 31st of October 2017? Thank you. Moving on, no points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Mental Health Scotland Act 2015, Commencement Number 4 and Transitional Saving Provisions, Order 2017, SSI 2017, Number 197, or the Act of Sedarent Rules of the Court of Session 1994, Amendment, Withdrawal of Agents and Judicial Review 2017, SSI 2017, Number 200 or the Act of Sedarent Rules of the Court of Session 1994 and Sheriff Court Rules Amendment Regulation EU 2015-848-2017 SSI 2017 number 202. So is the committee content with these instruments? Thank you. Now move the meeting into private.